Hello, it's the Easter Monday edition of News 360. Hello, good evening and welcome to the news. This bulletin is live from the News Hub here at Adesau in Kandakra. My name is Pa Kwisiasari. And I'm Natalie Fort. A look at the top stories this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint, GT Bank and Piccadilly Biscuits. Disaster management organization NADMO recommends reconstruction of Asafo market after fire destroyed over 200 shops in the market. Also in the bulletin, looming epidemic at Kolebu and its environs following leakage of a major sewage system. Also ahead this evening, Salaga Government Hospital takes delivery of ambulance, three incubators and an x-ray machine after TV3 report. In business, the Securities and Exchange Commission finalizes regulations which will serve as guidelines for real estate investment trust. And on the international front, wave of bombings that killed 290 people in Sri Lanka linked to an international terrorist network. We've got the very latest details of this, plus the very latest in sports news, all coming up in the next one hour. Be reminded that we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments, and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Do well to visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO, has recommended the reconstruction of the Asafo markets after fire destroyed over 200 shops in the market. NADMO has also taxed the Kumasi Metropolitan Metropolitan Assembly to demolish unauthorized structures in the markets that impede access. Here's a report by my colleague Ibrahim Abubakar. Hundreds of traders lost their livelihood in the Sunday and Saturday evening inferno at the Asafo market. Firefighters were at the scene on time to douse the fire, but access to the market was a hindrance to their efforts. All roads linking the market had been taken over by the traders, making it impossible for any vehicle to access. Firefighters had to park fire tenders outside the market before pulling the pumps to the fire scene to fight it. This led to the spread of the fire to other shops. Assessing the situation, Director General of NADMO, Nana Ajmain Prempe, says there is the need to reconstruct the market. He called on the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly to, as soon as possible, embark on a demolition exercise to clear unauthorized structures, impeding access to the market. When they got access later on, all the hydrant had been covered with an illegal containers. So the indisciplined part of it on our side, as citizens, is also bad. How can you use an illegal kiosk to also uh, cover the water hydrants? I mean, look at all this. So we are telling KMB that they have to bite. The NADMO boss indicated that they are in consultation with the Ministry of Works and Housing to distill strains in the market. The records are there that at any time there's rain, the place gets flooded very heavy and then with this water that is happening that's exactly what happened at uh, Kwame Nkrumah circle and we don't want that to repeat itself in any, in any part of this country. Kumasi Metropolitan Chief Executive Osei Esibe Entry is hoping the markets will be reconstructed in earnest. Looking at the extent of the damage there's no way apart from reconstructing the market so by supporting KME and the local government also coming on board, as well as the Minister for Works and Housing also coming on board. We hope within the shortest time we will reconstruct the market for the traders. Meanwhile, traders at the Kumasi Central Market have started erecting new structures after fire raised their shops on Friday evening. Well, certainly a very, very worrying situation there. Let's stay on it a bit longer and get onto Skype as we engage with David Tete Noy, who's a member of the Ghana Institute of Safety and Environmental Professionals. David, thanks for joining us this evening and welcome to News 360. My pleasure. 
Now, David, in three days, we've, wit we've witnessed three fires in two different markets in Kumasi. What are your initial thoughts to these incidents? Very unfortunate, I must say. And um, for KISEF as an association, as an institute, we are very much worried about the recent spate of fires. There are things that are avoidable, and we think we need to, as a country, we need to come together. We need to take bold steps and bold decisions to prevent these things from happening again. Now, you say that there are issues which are avoidable, and the issue of safety routes and access routes have always been a, a recurring problem in various market fire incidents. Is it that we're just not attending to this issue as, as urgently as we must? Exactly, and I, the NADMO boss um, said it precisely. We, we need to take ra rapid and drastic uh, measures, pull down markets that we need to pull down and quickly build up, build new ones, create good access. The ones that are existing, if there's a possibility to be able to look at the access routes and open them up, they're better for us because we cannot continue waiting for these things to happen. And the emergency services get in and they are not able to access the, the points of fire or where the occurrences are to be able to fight the fire. Now, in this particular incident, the NADMO boss highlighted the fact that many of these fire hydrants were inaccessible when, when they needed them, were covered up by structures. So what's the solution in that regard? Is it education? What do we do? Education is definitely one. But again, it comes with those, those who man our markets and our cities. Their town and country planning, the city planners have, have a plan. They have outlays of all these markets and these locations. So where we have hydrants that have been fitted for, to be used for such emergency situations, they must be demarcated and isolated in such a way that nobody can raise structures anywhere around them. Currently in our markets, if there are hydrants that have been either covered or um, hindered from access, we need to quickly move in and pull those structures away and free them because there, it's only the hydrants that can be used in this instance for such large fires to be able to effectively fight the fires. And you agree that reconstructing the, the market is the solution, a long-term solution? It's certainly the long-term solution. We cannot continue running the kind of markets we have now in, in Ghana. Our, our old markets, or our current markets are really old. You can see the new ones that are coming up currently in, uh, in Kumasi. I saw beautiful ones in Ho just this weekend. And a lot has been put in, in, into consideration to put up those markets. So access to the markets in terms of emergency, access to fire hydrants, in fact, there are water rails everywhere, advantage positions, fire extinguishers. This is exactly what we need to do. So we cannot run away from building ma new markets at all these places where we've got very old markets. David, thanks. Thanks for your time this evening. Grateful. David Tete Noy, member of the Ghana Institute of Safety and Environmental Professionals, sharing his take on the fires there in Kumasi. All right, thank you very much, uh, Natalie. And still on fires, the managing director of Cyprin Company Limited, a fire consultant, Prince Edu Afo, has blamed the recurrence uh, of market fires in the country on inadequate fire measures at the various markets. Now, speaking with my colleague, Eben Ejekum Boatin, he added the lack of training for market operators is also a factor in incidents of fires. With the recurrence of market fires in the country and three fires in Kumasi in the space of three days, a fire consultant, Prince Edu Afo, noted the need for attention to be paid to the market and old buildings. There are a few things that are happening around the country that actually puts us in a very good position for fighting fire. Um, a few of the high-rise buildings that we've seen in the country are making provision for sprinkler systems, which is very, very key. But a lot of our old buildings, I mean, if you take City House um, um, and most of the old buildings don't have sprinkler systems. So in the event of fire, we will actually suffer. And um, most of our fire hydrants are also not working and they are not in good shape. They may have been in place, but then you find that there's no water in them. So yes, there are a few things that needs to be done to put us in a better position when there is fire. The MD of Cyprin Company Limited was worried about lack of access to the market, inadequate fire hydrants in the market, and lack of maintenance of the available hydrants. What is important is to ensure that there's adequate water all the time. And then again, in terms of the source of the water, having proper connection to them, we do have the hydrants, we do have the lines, it's beautiful. But then I think the challenge we have is to actually get it 
filled with water all the time. I also don't think that people trying to tap into the lines are a major problem. But the problem is that we need to ensure that there's always water in the hydrant and that they are serviced. He partially blamed the recurrence of market fires on lack of adequate fire measures. The market women and the market men, or the people that actually operate from the market, don't have adequate training and education to be able to handle certain things or handle themselves to prevent fire from starting. You know, the thing that fire service will tell you that do not, do not let the fire start. And if the fire start, make every effort to minimize the spread. But then there's not enough training for people to say, okay, these are the habits that actually start fire within the market, and I need to be able to stop them. Because there's no adequate training, and there's not adequate measures like fire hydrants and other things. You hear a lot of stories that there's fire in the market, and fire service goes there, and the tanker runs out of water, and then that's it. They have to wait for the next one. But if there are adequate with hydrants within the market, it's just easy for fire service to tap into it and then they'll be able to get water and then they'll be able to find the fire. Prince Edu Afo had some advice for the general public. But what I always advocate is that let's not let the fire start and it is possible. If you build your own house, you will do everything possible to prevent the fire from happening. But then the market automatically, yes, they do own the stalls, but then the activities that go on that shouldn't actually go on within the market is what actually starts the fire. So a lot more education needs to go into the people that operate from the market to ensure that fire doesn't start at all. And you see certain mechanisms like smoke detectors, all right, they help I mean, if you look at this building, there's a smoke detector there. It helps to identify the fire very quickly so that you don't have to have the fire grow to a certain point. If you look at what we call the fire, um, um, the fire chain, all right, when the fire gets to a point where we call it the fully grown fire, it is very difficult to fight. Turn to some other stories this evening as Asantis are lauding their leader, Otum for Osei II for making a positive mark on Asanteman and Ghana since ascending the Golden Stool. They told TV3 the Asantehina's achievements in health, education, peace and security merit celebration. Here's reports by Benjamin Adu. Since his ascension to the throne in 1999, the Asantehina has been lauded for his development agenda. Otumfo has invested significantly in education and mediated political disputes between political parties. The Asantehene's pivotal role in the 2016 election contributed considerably in the political transition between the NDC and the MPP. After several years of disputes, the Asantehene led a group of eminent chiefs to find lasting solutions to the Dagbon crisis. Assessing the stewardship of the Asante Hini, some indigenous of the Ashanti region lauded his contribution to national development. Providing educational assistance to the needy. We have several talented kids in this world who, because of broken home, because of poverty in their various homes, they have not been able to pay their school fees. But through the Tomb for Scholarship, they have had the benefit and some of them have become doctors, lawyers and judges through Otum Force intervention. He had brought some reforms, and at the heart of it is the education foundation that he set up. So many people over the last 20 years have benefited immensely from his leadership. Otunfo Osetu to the Asantehine, you know, demonstrates his vision long before presidents and others, you know, uh, uh, talked about education or educating his people. He, he, he had led from the front. Otunfo has really done well for Ghana as a nation and then especially for the kingdom of Ashanti. If I were to tell you what he did for governments, uh, because as a regional minister I was part, uh, the Dabon issue, the hippie time and everything I knew and I was there. So he's done a lot. Only sometimes they say Ashwini Pankasa. The Tunfo is doing so well. It's, 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 a, it's a masterpiece of tradition and a culture and married with development. I think that's the way to go. And I want to encourage the other uh, the, the traditional authorities. I mean, even though they are doing well, but uh, the, the, the kind of modernity that is added to the traditions and customs is something that we need to encourage all other traditional authorities to be able to also to take their, 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 their cultures also up. 
The Asante Hene climb marks the celebration of his 20 years on the Golden Stool at Akwesidaekese on Sunday, April 21. Away from the Ashanti region, let's return to the greater Accra region where there is a looming epidemic at the Kolibu uh, Teaching Hospital and environs following the leakage of a major sewage system. My colleague Peter Kwawadato reports the leaking sewage, which has taken over parts of the road at the main Kolibu traffic light, has been running for over two weeks without any attention from authorities. It was about nine Monday morning and the location was the main Kolibu traffic intersection. This reporter who was on his way to an assignment at the Kolegono beach was drawn to a sudden foul smell. A cursory look revealed dirty water flowing onto the road. This prompted Peter Kwao Adato to alight in order to trace the source of the water. Our search took us to a manhole gushing sewage water. The sewage water had spilled over onto the road with the associated foul smell. It's two basic schools and a kitchen school are situated next to the gushing sewage water. Residents say they noticed the spill about two weeks ago and have reported to authorities at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital and Kolebu Polyclinic, but action is yet to be taken. Residents who declined to speak on camera feared the situation could lead to an epidemic if not attended to before schools reopen. Personnel of the Kolebu Motor Traffic and Transport Department, MTTD, on patrol backed the claims of the residents. The police said they find it difficult to stay at the main intersection to direct traffic due to the stench that emanates from the leaking sewage. Just as we were about leaving the scene, a herd of cows crossed from the opposite side of the road to begin drinking the leaking sewage water from the road. Certainly a worrying one there, needing urgent attention. But away from the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, the Senaga Government Hospital in the East Gonja District has taken delivery of an ambulance, three incubators and an x-ray machine. This follows a story by TV3 News in July last year on the state of the neonatal units and access to quality health care. Zabeda Ismail has the rest of the story. The Salaka Government Hospital was established in 1976 to provide outpatient services, pediatric, maternity, emergency, pharmaceutical and some medical services. The 100-bed capacity hospital recorded over 6,000 outpatient cases according to its 2018 annual health report. The facility provides medical services to patients from Salaga, Tandai, Nanumba North and South and Tassa. It also recorded 19 fresh still deaths in 2017 and the surge to 25 in 2018, a situation described by hospital authorities as worrying. TV3 in June last year reported on the state of the NICU. The Member of Parliament for Salaga South and Savannah Regional Minister Adam Salifu Braima presented an ambulance, three incubators, an x-ray machine and 120 bed sheets to the hospital. He promised to support in improving on quality healthcare delivery. We are bringing to you two ambulances, one for Salaga, one for Blo area. We are bringing you an x-ray machine. We are bringing you three incubators, bed sheets, one bed. The medical superintendent, Mohammed Sharif Ibn Khalid, applauded the MP for the gesture. He called for more support since the unit will still need other equipment to fully operate. For us as a hospital, we are grateful to the minister and then to our MP. But these equipment are not the only equipment that we we'll need for setting up a unitary intensive care unit. We we'll need other gadgets like uh, phototherapy machines and others. So we still appeal to other philanthropists and then civil service organizations who are interested in health to come and then uh, help us get these equipment to set up these, this particular center. 
A reminder, you're still watching News 360 live from Adesawe here in Kanda, Accra. We're streaming live on Facebook. Your views, comments and suggestions are welcome on any of our stories tonight. Uh, visit any of our social media feed on Facebook and on Twitter. Now on our MCN video report tonight, our citizen journalist Fahad Mohammed calls on government to complete a stalled six-unit classroom block at Achiasi in the Shanti region. This uncompleted school building is situated in Amum Achias in the Jusu municipality. And the building has been there since 2010. And the people of Amum Achias are appealing to the government to come and complete this six unit classroom block for them. This is Fad Mohammed Amum Achias in the Jusu municipality. Right, you can also send your video report via WhatsApp on 055-143-044. That's 055-143-044. Natalie? Absolutely. Stay with us here on News 36. You've got business news coming up for you shortly. Hello, good evening and welcome to the holiday edition of the business report on News 360. My name is Pa Kwesi Asari. Let's begin with happenings um, at the Securities and Exchange Commission where the commission has finalized regulations that will serve as guidelines for real estate investment trusts. Well, the REIT is a collective investment scheme that allows investors to pool resources together for investment in all real estates. Since 2010, Ghana has been tagged as experiencing a housing deficit of 1.7 million units. But industry players believe the deficit could be more, with 200,000 units required annually to fix Ghana's housing deficit. Real Estate Investment Trust, RIT, is a collective investment scheme for real estate investment. It allows for investment into real estate by a person or group of persons without necessarily requiring them to owe the brick and mortar. Director General of the Security and Exchange Commission, Reverend Daniel Obami Tete, observed the scheme will help in solving some of the housing challenges in the country. If like broadening the investment universe that is available. And there, 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 there are so many examples of other countries where the REITs have been used uh, to really transform uh, the real estate uh, sector, in particular the housing uh, issues. The Securities and Exchange Commission has finalized the regulations for the collective real estate investment scheme. We've worked on the guidelines, we've done some engagement with the market. We always do that so that the market's view is reflected in the guidelines. And we are at the point where we are ready to issue it as, as guidelines. In the 2018 and 2019 budgets, the Minister of Finance, Ken Oforiata, mentioned the scheme and the SEC boss noted its importance. It's one of the interventions that would really help in uh, addressing to a large measure the challenges with uh, housing here. The Real Estate Investment Trust will benefit the individual in the form of returns through dividends and for those in the real estate business as a source of funding. If the portfolio in the real estate is good, then dividends will be good. Elsewhere, the African Trade, uh, the African Union Trade Commissioner Albert Muchenga says one of the biggest threats to a successful continental agreement is counterfeiting. While speaking at the ongoing African International Conference on Trade and Finance, he warned that phenomenon, if not checked, can erode industrial gains made by African countries. Uh, TV3's Alfred Okanse reports from Addis Ababa. A major deficit of Africa's economic development has been the low level of intra-Africa trade. Intra-regional trade accounted for 10% of Africa's total trade in 2001, an increase marginally to 11% in 2015. Meanwhile, trading amongst members of the European Union amounted to 70% in 2015 and has been growing over the period. This, according to the African Union Commission on Trade, Albert Muchenga, is a major objective for a fast-tracked continental free trade agreement. Ethiopia's State Minister of Finance and Economic Cooperation, 
Dr. Tashomi Tafase, says Africa must pursue a complementary industrialization drive. The conference is expected to explore ways of enhancing intra-Africa trade, regional integration and trade liberalization. In less than a generation, Africa is projected to have a workforce of over 1.1 billion, over and above China and India. Now, this situation could either be one of a positive impact or otherwise, depending on the measures that's put in place before it happens. The African Union is looking and depending on the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement as one of the measures they intend to implement to create opportunities for the teeming workforce on the continent. Now, with 52 out of 55 countries now sign on to the agreement, the AU is waiting for the decision of Nigeria, Eritrea and Benin on the way forward. But until then, the conversation still continues at the headquarters of the African Union on the way forward in strengthening the various areas for trade and finance. From the AU headquarters here in Addis Ababa, my name is Alfred Okanse for TV3 News. In other news, Ambassador and Head of the European Union Delegation to Ghana, Dina Akonsia, says effective audit measures are in place to ensure monies given to government by the EU to execute projects are used for its intended purpose. She has lauded the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda by government, which she says will strengthen the Ghana-EU relations. Unemployment is a major socio-economic problem in Ghana and many other African countries even though Ghana's growth performance has been on the rise. Young people between the ages of 15 and 35 make up about a third of Ghana's population. To help government address the issue, the European Union will in June this year launch a 20 million euro project to help provide skills training to empower the youth. The project is to help the youth to engage in viable economic activities in their respective local communities. The ambassador and head of the European Union delegation to Ghana, Diana Akonsia, says rigorous measures are in place to ensure policies pursued by the EU achieve optimum results. We audit our projects. Uh, we ask for very detailed accounts uh, and then reports on achievement on the projects that we have, and we audit them after that they are closed. So there is a very strong control mechanism. Actually, there are a lot of procedures in place that are so complicated that sometimes our beneficiaries are not very happy. But this is the reality. We need that to make sure, as you said, that uh, the money is going to good use. It's the money of the European taxpayers, and so we want it to go to good use. The EU head to Ghana pointed out that the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda being pursued by the current administration will ensure a more strengthened relationship with the EU. During these days, the Ghana Beyond Aid is going to get more definition because there is going to be a strategy to be published. For the moment, Ghana Beyond Aid is a concept and a change of mentality. We have to do it for ourselves. We have to work now not to depend on aid in the future. Well, we like this very much because uh, on our side, we're, in fact, we're doing the same. We're trying to, to have in the European Union the same mentality shift that the Ghana Beyond Aid is doing in Ghana. Um, we want to move from a donor-recipient relationship to a partnership of equals, which is based on uh, common interests, shared values. The aim of the project is to equip the youth with employable and managerial skills that would offer them decent jobs locally to stem illegal migration to Europe. That's all for the very latest in business news. For more business news stories, do log on to our website, 3 newscom Over to you, Natalie. Thanks for business news, Farfrissi. Now, the Ghana Society of Radiographers has petitioned the Minister of Health and the Attorney General to restrain the Ghana Health Service from sending biochemical engineers to operate radiographic equipment across the country. The association maintains that the move by the Health Service is an attempt to put the lives of Ghanaians at risk while trained radiographers remain unemployed. In November 2016, the National Tuberculosis Programs Manager informed the Ghana Society of Radiographers of the deployment of digital X-ray equipment for the tuberculosis case detection project. The project, the first in Africa, employs a software called CAD4, which helps in early detection of tuberculosis for early management. However, 
The project, which is an agreement between the Dutch and Ghana governments, did not factor in human resource to man the machine. Instead of liaising with the Ghana Society of Radiographers, the Ghana Health Service is said to have sourced the assistance of the Nuclear Regulatory Authority for a waiver to train people in only radiation safety on June 30, 2017. An intervention from the professional body saw the submission of the names of 45 radiographers to the Ghana Health Service for employment. But securing financial clearance took months, leading to some of the unemployed graduate radiographers taking private appointments. With only two radiographers accepting the offer from the Ghana Health Service after a long-awaited financial clearance, this compelled the Director General of Ghana Health Service to call for a roundtable meeting between all stakeholders to profess immediate, short and long-term measures. The Ghana Society of Radiographers, which is the umbrella body of all registered and licensed practicing radiographers, says the lives of Ghanaians is at risk with this arrangement. There was a timetable circulating purported to be used to train biomedical engineers to work as radiographers. And for this, the professional body felt it was a slap in the face of radiographers to train biomedical engineers for just 10 days to do the work of licensed allied health practitioners who have undergone rigorous training in an accredited university for four years. A retired radiographer and lecturer at the University of Ghana, Lawrence Arthur, called for public awakening. 10 days training does not make somebody competent to practice as a radiographer. So the patient has more right to be involved in whatever examination or procedure that is being done on that person. Lecturer at the biochemist department of the University of Ghana, Dr. William Entry, is worried a four-year course is being compressed into 10 days. If you take one body area or one body part, even the finger, just small area, depending upon the clinical is what the doctor wants to see, has his own technique. What we have to do for the doctor to see what he wants. Can you use then this to do all these things? And you see, the curriculum they have drafted, it doesn't have any clinical component. That if I teach you how to do finger, then I have to take you to the clinical area, demonstrate to you how to position the patient. Each of these fingers have different techniques that we, we, we used to do. When we come to the wrist joint, we have different techniques. The Ghana Society of Radiographers has meanwhile called on the Attorney General and Minister for Justice and the Ministry of Health to intervene or they would resort to court to restrain the Ghana Health Service from putting Ghanaian lives at risk. Breathe in. Uh, tell me, breathe. Who stay with us here on News 360? On the entertainment front, the founder of One Mic Entertainment, Ochami Kwame, has launched his latest album titled Made in Ghana at Plus 233 Jazz Bar and Grill. The Made in Ghana album highlights virtues across the various regions in Ghana and featured artists such as Kwame Eugene, Kidi, Wiyala and Feli Nuna. <laughs> Born Kwame in Siapao, Achiami Kwame, as is widely known, is making waves with the Made in Ghana campaign. The 14 track album features 10 different artists from all the initial 10 regions and picks different sounds and sights all over the country. Family, friends, and other industry players gathered at the Plus 233 Jazz Bar and Grill to unveil the latest project. The theme song, I Am Made in Ghana, features Kitty. Other great tunes of the Made in Ghana album include Inobi Mamata featuring Kwame Eugene, Melon featuring Felinuna, Boga Tanga Girl featuring Abiana and Atongo Zimba, and Dictana featuring Riala and Kinwa. To rap doctor, 
The Made in Ghana album is his most important album as it promotes trade and build nationalism. But this is the album that I've done that says I am made in Ghana. This one is about my people. It's about self. That means my environment, my land, my clothes, my philosophies, my traditions, my culture. And so I think this is the most important thing I have done in my whole life. Congratulations to Ochami Kwame on his uh, Made in Ghana album launch yesterday. Well, it's been a very long Easter holiday. Yes, uh, yes. And people have been having fun good, all I, I over. Think, yes. The guys went to JKT. JKT. Yes, lots of, lots lots of, of fun there. And yes. those in Kweu as well. well. Tomorrow is a working day. Uh, back to work. Back to work. But it's been a good period. We hope you've enjoyed your Easter. I'm sure they have. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for watching. My name is I'm Natalie Fords. For a lot more news, do visit our website, 3news.com. Thanks so much for watching. Have a lovely evening.